ahead and get started. Welcome, thank you for joining. We are, this is our third webinar in a series on social enterprise and all profit and charity models and B Corps, all things social enterprise that Impact Makers Foundation is hosting. The Impact Makers Foundation was created to, to support socially responsible businesses and B Corps in the communities in Central Virginia and other places where Impact Makers did business and also to uh, support social enterprise uh, uh, education and events like this to get to uh, improve understanding of social enterprise, B Corps, and all profit and charity models. So thank you, Mike Hannigan, for joining. I have with us Mike Hannigan, the founder of Give Something Back, a founding B Corp, an early early social entrepreneur, uh, social enterprise in the, in the Berkeley, Oakland area, in the Bay Area, East Bay. And um, uh, for full disclosure, also a friend mentor and board member of impact makers so we're very pleased and excited to have mike join um you know mike will tell you more about his company but as you know impact makers is an all profit charity model uh and um he'll tell you more about give something back but it was also founded on a and it was around a lot longer than impact makers was also founded in an all profit to charity model so we've been kindred spirits for some time and today we want to explore not just his thoughts on social enterprise generally, but really there was big news um, with Patagonia actually adopting an all profit charity model very similar to what Impact Makers adopted in 2015. And so I wanted to get uh, Mike's um, thoughts, experience, et cetera. But um, Mike, do you, do you mind before we get started, um, just giving a very brief background of your, you know, your life, your career leading up to finding Give Something Back? You know, and how did you first get involved? You know, let's just start there. A, a yeah. background of you know how you how you ended up in your journey to get involved in social enterprise and start give something back. Great. So um, I guess just the short answer is completely accidental. I did not come from a business background. Uh, I went to college in the '60s and '70s in uh, mathematics and biology. But like all students in the 60s and 70s, if you went to a college campus, you confronted with all kinds of social movements that you were encouraged or whatever to dis to participate in. So I became involved in the anti-war movement, the, the student activist movement, the civil rights movement, all that kind of stuff that was happening in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and so that stamped me with my basic core values and what my interests in life were. So I saw myself but, but on the other hand, I'm also a drifter. I'm not somebody who ever, from the very beginning, ever had an idea of what was next for me. I didn't you know, say, I wanna be a fireman, or I wanna join the Navy, or I wanna be a doctor or a lawyer. You know, My life is kind of characterized by this, just kind of falling into things <laughs> without, without much of a plan, and then, and then hoping, hoping it worked out. So, uh, but I went, to, I went to a graduate school in Berkeley after I, I graduated in philosophy uh, because of, you know, it has a political, social and political bent to it. And it was consistent more with my values. And I went to graduate school in Berkeley because I wanted to be in Berkeley because Berkeley was, you know, Berkeley in the 70s for a, an activist type like myself. And I studied criminology. And the graduate program in criminology, the doctoral program was closed down, even though it was the only doctoral program in the country because it's too critical of the criminal justice system. And it was merged with the law school and the School of Education. So I left graduate school in 1975 um, and took a job at the Xerox Corporation because I needed a job. I had my first child um, uh, and I needed to make a living. So I took a job at the Xerox Corporation. And for the next, from 1970, maybe eight till 1991, when I started to give something back with uh, my business partner, I, I was in the office products business. And then after hours, I would go for, you know, protest U.S. foreign policy in Nicaragua. You know, so I had two li I had two lives and they were completely distinct. One was my business life, making a living. One was my values life, uh, you know, involving myself in community activism and issues that were important to me. Um, so during that period of my business career, First of all, Xerox was a very great place to learn business. It was a very progressive company in its day. It was like the Google of its day, a virtual monopoly. So they had an infinite amount of money to spend on stuff. Um, but I, so I got to learn how business functions from a very, uh, a very professional point of view at Xerox. And then I also spun off and went to smaller companies as an employee or a general manager or something. So I learned how businesses, startups function, 
how marketing, how finance, how human resources, all the things that are necessary for the successful function of a business. I learned that kind of accidentally. I picked up this whole set of tools, which I had no idea what were how I was going to use them for the rest of my life. And and then suddenly a point came in 1990 when those two lives came together with the founding of Give Something Back. So, but I think the important stuff is I didn't have any business training. It was all on the job. I didn't have any values integrated into my business work until I found a way to join those two. And um, so I think that's the quick answer to the question of how my personal path to the business world to, right. to up to the point of founding Give Something Back occurred. Well, I remember the criminology. I think I forgot the philosophy. So just when you were talking, I just, I just uh, uh, thought about, you know, maybe there's a Descartian, uh, you know, it's a criminal commits a crime and no one's there to see it did they did the crime really occur right yeah the crime did occur <laughs> so there were, there were victims. There were victims. But, but you know there was a whole cohort of people that started right. businesses in my generation wow. yeah. that didn't come to it from a business background i mean right. gary erickson at cliff bar for example you know he, he created a product that he needed to to that tasted better on his bicycle rides and you know yvonne shenerwood from patagonia he created you know tools that helped him as a climber so and then right. And Paul Newman was an actor. He started this business with spaghetti sauce and uh, salad dressing. So, and these businesses were successful, not because the founders saw themselves as business people, but they saw business as a tool to produce products and services that were compatible with their values in their other lives. And I think there's a whole generation of uh, business people that came into business from non-business backgrounds that turned out to be fairly successful. Well, certainly around Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, right. not just Berkeley. Um, so I think people often have, and I, I always like to give every, give everyone a chance to kind of define this differently. You, you know, it's kind of like that joke, you get, you know, two social entrepreneurs in the room and you ask them what social enterprise means, you get six answers, right? So mm -hmm. yep. just to get everyone level set, for those that are maybe joining for the first time or hearing about it for the first time, from your perspective, what is the term social enterprise and what does impact investing mean? How do you define those terms? Well, you know, those, those are interesting terms because mm -hmm. in a sense, they're very, they're misleading terms because, you know, all enterprise is social enterprise. All impact, all investing is impact investing. I mean, it, enterprise and in investment has an impact on the broader society, not just on the investor or the, or the company that receives the investor or the customers. Of, so for me, the key the social enterprise and impact investing depend upon whether or not a business or an investment qualifies under the um, we understand those terms to mean is that the community benefit and I, I would contrast impact investing with private investing and social enterprise with private enterprise and the distinguishing factor is who owns and controls the outcome of those enterprises and investments and who benefit from the outcome of those enterprises and investments. So, and, and so social impact, social entrepreneurs and impact investors, hopefully are looking at the impact of their endeavors on the larger community, on the environment, on their employees, on the community, uh, on their customers, on their own, on themselves and their pros personal prosperity. Uh, and for me, that depends upon a structural connection to a definable and measurable impact on a larger set of stakeholders, which includes the ones I just mentioned, community employees, blah, 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 governance, blah, blah, blah. So unless those outcomes are embedded legally and in the governance structure of the enterprises or the investment itself, it's any the good stuff that comes out of it is philanthropy because it's not a routine outcome of the endeavor. So that's for me, to be a social entrepreneur, you have to have a community, a series of community benefits addressing the stakeholder, broad stakeholder needs, mandated, embedded in the structure of the business or in the governance documents. Otherwise, the good stuff that people do with the profits they make out of their investments, is that's, that's philanthropy, which is different than social enterprise. Uh, but it also implies the marketplace, commerce, buying and selling of right. goods for a profit in a competitive marketplace mm -hmm. that creates a surplus. And so the question is wh who is entitled to the benefit or the deficit created by that, uh, by that surplus or deficit. 
Thank you. It's always good to hear different people's definitions of those terms, because like I said, no one can agree <laughs> oftentimes. Um, you know, I think uh, for those that are just hearing about you and give something back for the first time, I'd love for you to share kind of your founding story. You kind of alluded to it a little bit, but if you can tell a little bit more, uh, whether it's a social enterprise or a business, it's always hard to start a business. So maybe yeah, yeah. talk a little bit about the founding, how, how long it took to kind of get to sustainable profitability. You know, when you get to when you're an all profit charity model, you have to have profit to yep. be able to give to charitable organizations. So tell us a little about how you turned an idea into a successful business when it started giving and maybe, um, you know, what, what the total impact to date, if you kind of have those numbers in your head, for okay. for you know what you what you did through uh, you, the years of uh, give something back. Okay, uh, first of all, it, in our early infancy, we started the company was started in 1991, September of 1991, uh, and very quickly we won like an Inc. magazine award for the worst name, the worst corporate name in America. Give something back, and the reason is it says nothing at all about the business. You know what we buy, what we sell, what we serve. You know. So let, here's a here's a, a couple of sentence description of what Give Something Back business products was. Um, so we were like Staples or Office Depot. We're an office supply company selling office supplies, furniture, printing to commercial customers and government customers, nonprofit customers for a profit. But the difference and we competed with other, you know, vendors like Staples and Office Depot. The difference is our profit did not belong to the stockholders, which were myself and my business partner, uh, by we set the company up so that the profits were going to be donated at some point in the future to uh, nonprofit organizations. So the company was, was understood itself as being a for-profit business, creating a profit and distributing the profit back to the community. So we're trying to engineer a structure where the marketplace would produce benefits, but those benefits would go would be returned back to the community at large rather than siphoned off by the owners uh, of the of the business. Um, and so that's how we were set up initially. That was written into our bylaws. It wasn't legal because there was no benefit corporation statute at the time in, in 1991. But uh, that's the way we operated from the very beginning. Um, so the company started. The, I, I came up with the idea. I mean, it's strange. It's a strange thing, but. I came up with the idea when I was shopping for uh, spaghetti sauce for dinner one night. I had my marriage had ended, and and you know single guys oftentimes eat spaghetti sauce for dinner out of bottles. So I was shopping for mine, and I noticed one of the products on the on the shelf at Safeway near my house in Berkeley was Newman's own spaghetti sauce, and it had a big sticker on it that said "All profits donated to charity," but it didn't cost any more. It was organic. It looked like it tasted good, and it did taste good. So as a consumer. I was faced with this choice and one of the choices not only would give me the product that I enjoyed at a price that was fair and competitive, but also it did uh, it did the extra work of community service just by the act of my choosing it over something else. And so the light bulb went on at that point. I said, you know, that's that's a business model. And, and at this point, Newman's Own was very successful. Uh, they were donating millions of dollars worth of profit. Uh, most of their customers had no idea about the profit, but the profit donation part, they were buying it because it was it satisfied their consumer needs. Um, so, but that business model to me resonated with the kind of products that we were selling because our business customers were interested in a competitive price for the products they were going to buy anyway for their businesses. So, if we could offer the same products at the same price that our competitors are offering, we felt there might be a competitive advantage to having the customers also understand that the profits instead of going back to the stockholders would be distributed to nonprofit organizations. And we set the distribution of profit process up to be a democratic one. So, you know, I was a relatively prosperous white guy who, you know, who has certain values and life experiences that would, you know, favor certain kind of nonprofit organizations out of my life experience. But, you know, those aren't the same ones of all of our customers and certainly not in our San Diego office. So the donation process was a democratic process. So for example, 15% of our sales would come from our San Diego office. So 15% of our profits would be donated to nonprofit organization, 501c3s in the San Diego region, selected from a list provided by us to our customers and our employees who would select the organizations that would get the profit. So the, the model was to create a profit locally through competition 
to redistribute their profits locally through through choices made by people who live and work in those communities and who, in our estimation, would have the best insight into who is doing the best community service work on the most impressing issues. So that's that's how the business started. And and it was, so before it started, first of all, it was started by me and my business partner, Sean Marks, who has um, who has an entirely different set of skills than than me. So I'm, I'm pretty good at administration, finance, supply chain, all that kind of stuff. Sean is a great sales and marketing guy. And I knew that, and, and he knew that a business is not going to be successful unless the original management team or founding team did not cover all of those skill sets. So Sean and I worked together at our, one of my previous companies that I was the general manager of. Uh, so we did, I convinced him um, to start a company based on the Newman's own business model in the area that we had developed expertise in. So we spent about a year putting together a really detailed two-year business plan, cash flow analysis, income statement, and a balance sheet um, that based on what we knew we could produce. So we knew that a, a, a customer would produce $50 in sales per month in office supplies. So we knew how to get those customers, how long they would last, what they would buy, so based on those formulas that we had learned in our business experience, we created a two-year business plan um, that we felt we could accomplish with the capital that we had available. We had $40,000 in capital. Each of us threw in $20,000. So we knew that we weren't going to be able to get any additional capital for this crazy business model. Um, so we built a business model that did not run out of cash if there was only $40,000 in initial capital. So it had to be a stockless model. We couldn't invest a million dollars in inventory. So we built this business model and then each month we would execute the business model. And, you know, we hit that business model almost to the dollar for the first two years. Mm -hmm. um, and so we were profitable. We were profitable in our first year and we, we were profitable every year after that for the next 27. Uh, but it depended upon, I think the reason we were successful early on, first of all, we started in 1991, which many economists will pinpoint as the beginning of a huge business cycle, up business cycle. So, which means you'd have to be almost an idiot to fail in any business that you started in that period of time. Second of all, um, we, we, we came at a time when uh, the, tr the industry we were in was transitioning to a stockless model. So mm -hmm. the companies that basically were sitting on a bunch of inventory and a bunch of warehouses waiting to be sold with capital in invested in that unsold inventory, we're going out of business. The ones that were stockless were, were doing very well. So, and the infrastructure that was underneath all the companies that were involved in the office products business were supportive of a model like us. So we could order anything we needed for our customer. A customer would order products from us. We would go buy those products that day from our suppliers who would ship those merchandise that merchandise to us that night. The next morning it would be on our trucks, would be at our customer's office the next day. And we didn't miss a single day for the next 27 years of delivering all the products our customer bought from us. And that was only possible because the infrastructure, the supply chain created the pathway for companies that had $40,000 to sell, you know, $30 million worth of merchandise without running well, out of inventory. Right. When you said stockless, you weren't talking about stock. Stockless means stock. no inventory. You're talking about inventory. Right. In, I'm talking about inventory. Right. So yes. Right. We didn't so, have any, we, our warehouses just had trucks and right. paper. Everything else came to us in the middle of the night and was redistributed to our customers the next day. So that was one of the features. Um, but also there were, you know, there are lots of other elements that were working in our on our behalf. There was, uh, you know, there's a growing awareness of the income and wealth disparities in America. So the, the customer base was more open to a proposition that business could have a positive impact on the community through just making a choice. Uh, versus alternative choices of products. So there were there were lots and lots of things um, that, that it, but the other thing is that Sean, both Sean and I were the kind of entrepreneurs that were willing to not take a salary for a couple of years. I mean, I've been in a bunch of startups where, you know, right. the first few people, people demand $200,000 in order to join as a sales manager. We right. didn't have that luxury and we didn't have that expectation. So Sean and I, we're willing to build the company without taking money out of it until we became profitable. And then we would begin to take a salary. 
so that financial discipline was embedded in our original business plan, and we we're willing to really to submit to that. So, so you you put, you t you put in sweat equity for a company that you had no equity in, or no no upside in really. Well, yes, the profit. Uh, except that we had a business model that told yeah. us we could grow from zero to, you know, a million dollars in the first year, two million dollars the second year, four million dollars the third year. And if we could achieve that, right. we could predict what our profitability would be now. But we also, given the fact that we were making this proposition to our customers, that all of our profits are being donated to community organizations. We also realized that as owners, we could not take exorbitant salary. So in our bylaws, we limited our own incomes, just the owners, me and Sean, to no more than 70% of what a manager in a particular, a similar position in a similar company in our area would be making. So, you know, if the CEO of a $10 million office supply company was making, you know, $125,000, we couldn't make more than $70,000. So we always put a limit so neither of us ever made more than I think $152,000, which is the most we ever made. Um, but that was a promise that we made to our customers so that the stockholders didn't figure out ways to loot the company of profits before the distributions are made. So, but, but on all other factors, as any business person knows, what you do in terms of your employees, in terms of your pricing, in terms of your customers is driven by the marketplace. So, you know, right. if you think cool. if you think a driver deserves twenty five dollars an hour and Office Depot is paying him twelve fifty and you pay yours twenty five, you're going to be out of business. But you also can't pay him nine dollars an hour because you're not going to get them. They're going to go to Office Depot. So right. Right. The, uh, the compensation of our employees, the prices of our products were determined for us by the marketplace. And we were pretty good. At, uh, at at harnessing the marketplace formulas for a successful business model. So that's that's uh, can, th can, those you are, share, those can you share the total community value created in the life of the company and when 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 you when you uh, exited the business? So yeah. it was ninety one until when and what was the total value community impact? You, I, you know, I think the most obvious thing that people think in terms of the value we created for the community and our social enterprise model was the amount of money we donated, which probably didn't amount to more than ten million dollars over the time of the whole time. We, I mean, it's a very low margin industry we're in. I right. mean, a good a good year for an office supply company is anywhere between two and four percent of profit and we were a for-profit company so we had to pay income taxes and all that stuff so we probably gave away around 10 million dollars but um, we also hired a lot of people we had we tried to bring in people who had barriers to employment that could perform at high levels that were necessary mm -hmm. to compete with our competitors um, well you're an example i think of of one of the uh, you know of one of the benefits of that accrued of from our business. So, you know, we invested in you, for example, we came to realize at some point that, well, why don't we take some of this profit instead of giving it to a nonprofit that will do something good with it? Why don't we invest it in another social enterprise who will accelerate that good That's right. by turning that investment into a much larger return? I mean, we, you know, our company started with $40,000 and we gave away $10 million without ever borrowing, uh, without ever right. any other additional investment. So that's the power of the marketplace in a capitalist society is that you can take a very small investment and turn it into a very large return. So, and yeah, I think, so we made investments in lots of social enterprises that accelerated or that amplified our impact beyond what we could have done, achieved with, by just giving, you know, $20,000 to the food bank, which would do great things for that $20,000, but $20,000 to a give something back could produce five million dollars worth of donations over 20 right. years so um so that's but also we've always viewed me in particular and sean as well but me most so more because i grew up in a period of time when social movements were available and on the agenda we've always seen our own role as part of a much broader movement to reorganize the economy in whatever way we could to produce flows of resources back to the community rather than to, into the into the into the bank accounts of stockholders so um so we have always been very supportive and contributed to the development of the infrastructure underneath the social enterprise movement so you know we were very early adopters of b corp the b corp movement we were the first uh benefit corporation in california we actually were the first of 11. there was 11 of us Wow, had to go okay. this with us. Yeah. Um, so anytime we could contribute to the development of tools, 
legal structures that would advance ourselves and the movement, we would we would be willing to financially invest in the development of those tools and institutions. So, um, and also, you know, I've spoken hundreds, probably thousands of times to, you know, business students and classes yeah, and conventions and stuff like that. And, you know, so the knowledge that I have picked up and my commitment to kind of the social benefits of business as a, as a tool, um, hopefully has, you know, inspired other people or given other people ideas of what they could do. And, you know, I, I can probably name a bunch of people that, have you know heard me talk that said oh you know i went and started a socially responsible insurance company or i went and started so i think when i founded impact makers i found you online and uh and said i want to be you guys right when i started right and i and i and you would have done that anyway but but we probably just like newman's own satisfied for us the fact that this is not a totally risky thing here's a company that's done a very similar thing in scale that very large so right. people that that's a crazy idea. Well, you know, it's not a crazy idea. It's been done and been done successfully. So we're an example which, of which, by done. the way, brings us to Patagonia. So, yeah, um, you know, I think Paul Newman did it first and he did it. He was, a, a you know, could, could have been a one off because he's a already very wealthy guy and famous. So what the hell? Yep. Why not? Right. Yeah. I think you and I did it from the beginning and we yep. structured it in a way that was um, and, but and we're not famous. <laughs> We were just average people starting a business. We're not famous. We're, unfortunately, no. But uh, you know, maybe one day. But uh, but but you know, we did this thing, and, and it was based on values, and it was based on you know trying to you know kind of prove that you don't have to be rich and famous to to do it. Um, right. I think Patagonia kind of had a model like that from the beginning, but he didn't go the full kind of all profits to charity, donate his company till it was worth billions. So I'd love to yeah. kind of get your thoughts on kind of where, what's your take on what on, on the Patagonia, you know, change, uh, you know, what, how is that going to affect the, you know, social enterprises generally? How is that going to affect the, the movement? Is it a one-off thing? Is it the beginning of a trend? I just love your thoughts. Where do, where do you, well, where do you I, think you know, this shows and where do you think it, where do you think it takes us? You know, I wish I could, I wish I could predict what the future is, but I, I I will say this: there's a whole bunch of of the original socially responsible, successful businesses that have been bought by large corporations. So you know, Cliff Bar is a good example. I mean, Gary Erickson eventually sold the company for 2.9 billion dollars. He and his wife owned 80 percent of it, and the employees owned the rest. So, but they're now owned by a company that is you know, presents himself as progressive, but they're a stockholder owned company. Ben and Jerry is a good example. Uh, New Belgian Brewing is a good example. So there's all these companies that have started and been successful based on a value proposition that has a strong community component that are now in the hands of enterprises that don't have those same values embedded in their structure. Okay. Now, and I think this is probably, Patagonia is a good counter example of that because I think Patagonia, the, first of all, he controlled the values that were incorporated into his company because he owned the stock. Right. right. And so right. there was no deviation from those values because there was no counterparty that had the authority to deviate from those values because he owned it all. But I, he also realized that once he was gone, he needed to protect those values. And you can't protect those values by selling it off to, you know, Unilever or, you know, Heineken or whatever. But so and i've known a couple of companies that came to that point that they wanted to ensure to the best extent possible that the community values that were embedded in the business model would be would succeed the would, would succeed into the future and you know so he went with a very interesting model he went with a i think a charitable a perpetual charitable or non-charitable trust so all the all these community values are embedded in the trust documents and those documents can't be changed i mean the thing about a trust is that the trust has to meet the goals that are set by the trust creator which in this case was him so no board of directors no change of ownership can occur that can change the rules that he originally set up it's virtually it's much safer than a benefit corporation yeah or the company bylaws barrett kohler a company that i was on their on their which is a very significant and important publishing company, progressive publishing company, they chose the same strategy. They converted to a perpetual non-charitable trust as a way to ensure that their business model 
and not being sold out to, you know, Penguin Random House or someone like that was guaranteed into the future. And the only way they could do that was to convert to this trust model because trusts are basically very hard to change the rules. Uh, it's one of the safest enclosures of values. So, um, but, uh, you know, I think it remains to be seen. I think one of the key factors is the people who sold these companies to multinational companies, I think it's important to consider what they do with the money that they made yeah. from selling the company. So, you know, if, if uh, you know, if Gary Erickson goes and buys, you know, two mansions in, uh, you know, Mallorca, that would be a, a failure. But, you know, he's not going to do that. He's going to basically find ways to use these resources that he's accumulated as a result of selling his socially responsible business. He's going to find other ways to positively impact the community with the, with those resources because he no longer has control of the of what come of the resources that are produced by the continuation of Cliff Bar. Right. Same thing with New right. Belgian, the same thing for all the other uh, although Ben and Jerry's is I think a good counterexample because they did they had some very interesting positive effects on their acquirer that turned their acquirer into a more of a socially responsible business as a result of acquiring Ben and Jerry's. That's right. Uh, so That's the, right. the tail kind of more wagged the dog in that situation. So well, and then they bought other, other, and then Unilever bought other socially responsible exactly. businesses like seventh generation, right? Right. But, but, but as a matter, I, but I think I would say as a blanket statement, community enterprises that have strong community missions embedded into their structure, and their governance, put those missions at risk when they sell to stockholder owned companies. And, you know, so I, I would say it's, it's, a, it's certainly, I would expect, I think this is kind of what happened with uh, the co when Coca-Cola decided they're going to shut down Honest Tea, right? I mean, not, it was a great deal for them until it was not profitable anymore. And they said, well, you know, it's not contributing sufficiently to the bottom line. So later for you. So, so that, well, you know, a question I have, I mean, just naturally going there, but, and I was going to save it for later, but I think a question I have related to exactly this topic is, can social enterprises scale and keep their mission? I mean, you look at, and, and do they need to, do they need to, in order to scale, um, do they need to partner or be bought by a larger company? I mean, Stonyfield Farms, which is bought mm -hmm. by Dannon, right? And Dannon became yep. a B Corp recently as a corporate entity, but, yep. you know, Stonyfield Farms, their view is we're actually able to get organic yogurt to everyone by being bought by uh, by them. And, and now we're at Walmart and now we're everywhere in the world. And now it's a much bigger brand, much bigger impact. Um, so by scaling, we're making larger impact. While it might be a deal, a, a, you know, a deal with the devil, we're able to achieve our mission. And does the, the does that scaling, can, it, can, I guess the question is, is that a true statement? Can you scale and keep your mission or over the long term? Do you just get shut down by Coca-Cola because they took you in, they 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 killed you as a competitor, and now they can move on with their crappy drinks again, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I think I, I think it's not it's not an either or. I think yes, if you're if your mission is to sell organic organic uh uh what is that stuff? Yogurt. <laughs> if your mission is to sell organic yogurt. Yeah, their mission is probably achieved better by affiliating with a multinational corporation that can that can scale that mission because that's consistent with. But their they, but the company that bought them, their mission isn't to sell organic yogurt. Their mission is to make produce a return for their stockholders. Right. So our mission was to eliminate the stockholder interest because our the, for us the main social problem that our company was set up to address was the accumulation of wealth and income in a smaller and smaller segment of the population. So a, a fair and share, a fairer share of the national resources that are produced by economic behavior, we're interested in distributing that more broadly through the, through the economy. So, and that requires the limitations of the rights of stockholders to accumulate the wealth that's produced by businesses and just, and to force the distribution of that wealth and resources back into the community. So, um, so yes, I think, maybe there's they sell more yogurt but they are also contributing to the larger problem of the concentration of wealth in fewer and fewer hands 
um, as a result of affiliating with an entity whose primary goal is to re provide a return on investment for their stockholders. Well, and so I think, and I think the question is, if I put my cynical hat on, is it really, you know, is the leadership that makes the sale and puts and justifies it through, we're able to get more organic yogurt into the hands of and help the New Hampshire farmers who are, you know, who are organic farmers by, by getting things into Walmart and growing and scaling. But it also is the social entrepreneur cashing out in a business as usual, you know, uh, ex exit strategy to get wealthy, just like any other firm and follows the model of, yep. you know, predatory capitalism and not necessarily, you know, stakeholder capitalism that we're supposed to be upholding as social entrepreneurs. So I guess, you know, you're, what's you're, I think you're absolutely right. The right answer. <laughs> well, I don't think there is a, I think the, the devil's in the details. So, so right. if, if, uh, if Gary, at Stonyfield or whoever the other original socially responsible investors were, if they took their the funds that they received from selling the company and compromising the future mission and they invested it in, in ways that produce other social benefits down in the future, I think that's that's on the progressive side of the balance sheet. On the, and the, on the other side, they've lost, uh, they've, they've lost the, the profit benefit of producing you know, the, the yogurt that goes to rich people who are, you know, basically earn additional income as a result of their investment in Stony, in uh, Danone or Unilever or, or whatever, um, and, and pay a lower tax rate than the workers who work in those companies, of course, <laughs> for their profits. Um, so I think that's on the negative side of the balance sheet. But I, I think, <laughs> I don't think there's anything inherently in a business that is legally and organizationally and governmentally required to operate in a way that measures their impact on a larger set of community stakeholders. I don't think there's anything inherently uh, limiting about their growth capabilities, except for access to capital. Okay, when capital is needed. Right. But if they're successful, you have access to, you know, borrowing from banks who are interested in making profit on profitable loans. Uh, but also there's a, there's a, <laughs> I think, and this is the big challenge in the future, is to create a larger pool of community capital, okay? In other words, capital that is invested in commerce that comes from and returns back to um, investors that are embedded in the community, foundations, uh, things like that. Now, so foundations who are sitting on trillions of dollars worth of assets, who previously were limited to 5% of their who could only who could give away just five percent of their assets and right. and uh, and qualify as nonprofit charitable organizations? Well, the law in the last few years has changed to allow them to use some of their endowments now, the other ninety five percent, to invest in social enterprises, even if they even if they may not be as successful as investing in Exxon or Chevron. Okay, right. the law now allows them to use their ninety five percent, which used to be invested in market rate securities to now invest those in social enterprises. So that that opens up the possibility of a you know, trillion dollars worth of community capital, which should be available to companies like yours, or com companies like mine used to be, or other companies that whose return on an investment right. would be definable and measurable in terms of community well-being. So I think there are tendencies in both directions. So, but I totally get so, the, yeah. the thing about, you know, selling out, I mean, cause I, I don't, I don't know that I have an answer. I just, I thought it was an interesting conversation yeah. to have with you. Yeah, Another interesting is. conversation though, is to ask you, um, given the wild success, if you will, of some of these social enterprises that have been bought by the, you know, the very large corporations and scaled, um, given, um, you know, but also given that B Corp movement started in 2007 and you know, there's millions of businesses. There's only about 5,000 B Corps. That's not yep. changing the world at least yet. Do yep. you think that the kind of the social enterprise B Corp movement is going to be successful in some way and kind of redefining capitalism? Do you think it already has, or do you think this is kind of a hippies and dreamers movement of people trying to do business in a socially responsible way as a fringe movement? And I, 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 think, I think it's, I think there are, one can make an argument both ways. On the one hand, you're absolutely right. When I started my company in 1991, if I were to say, okay, 25 years from now, 
what is going to be the evidence of our success in creating an institutional flow of resources through our business that increases the resources available to the community and decreases the resources available to stockholders. Um, and if I were to say 25 years from now, what's the measurement of that? It would be, you know, income distribution and wealth distribution, but you know, the or stronger social institutions like stronger public health institutions, stronger public education institutions. And you know, exactly the opposite has happened. So in terms of, in terms of, so if you look at the needle that would have measured our success as part of a movement that was trying to move the needle, the move, the needle has moved back in the opposite direction, which is, which, you know, one, you could say that's a failure. On the other hand, if you look at the infrastructure that has been built up to support business as a tool to create community well-being, the infrastructure is infinitely larger now than it used to be. You cannot go to a business school 21 years ago, 25 years ago, you went to a business school, you'd never find a social enterprise course or anyone interested right. in right. using their business for a social, but now you can't go to a, you know, a business school without finding a really big cohort of students that want to be involved in business, but, but also want to do it in a way that's compatible with their values. And their values include equality and justice, blah, blah, blah. So the availability of the workforce that can transform the work, the business community, yep. the availability of impact investment dollars has, has escalated dramatically. The laws have changed, you know, the benefit corporation statutes, all that work that was done by the B Corp people to create legal protections for community efforts uh, through business success. So the infrastructure has grown dramatically. Now it hasn't moved the needle, but you know, that's, that you can it either has be... not. It has not. I mean, I think I, I I agree with you. It hasn't moved the needle. I also look at the business roundtable, right? The the yep. super conservative major corporation heads who came out with language about stakeholder capitalism that could have been right yep. out of the B right out of the B Corp movement. Now that's a lot of words and no action and nothing nothing measurable, but it shows that they're responding to pressure from consumers who are demanding it from investors who are demanding yeah. to invest in social responsible businesses that at a minimum they've got to start paying lip service and talk about social impact yeah uh, even if they aren't necessarily doing it and maybe some will be inspired to actually do it and it'll eventually become but I, I think but i think you're right there's a lot of movement but i don't know that we've made me move really demonstrated uh, measurable impact. There is movement. Though. Well, except except we're even we're I mean, one of the things the movement has created with is a much more robust ability to measure impact. You know, True. we couldn't measure impact in the same way before. I mean, there's always been greenwashing. I mean, back in the, you know, General Motors back in the '60s used to say, "What's good for General Motors is good for the community." I mean, you know, there's always lip service to connecting your business enterprise with some community benefit because that's what consumers want um but so i so i i think it, there is a it requires a certain amount of faith that we're building something that ultimately will have a, a greater and maybe we'll hit some kind of a flashpoint or or incremental growth or whatever i mean i've, I've been there before you know i was i was a sentient human being when nixon won the landslide election in 1972 when we me and my my cohort of you know activists felt the world that was ending kind of like right now we feel like you know fascism is mm -hmm. running around the corner but two years later he was out a whole new a whole new uh effort, effort was in not fundamentally new but demonstrably new yeah so things can change very quickly especially if the world change and or the conditions that of that people experience of their life changes and and today you know the disparities are so glaring so hurtful to so many people who are feel their security is in a precarious situation, not because prosperity isn't there, but it's not shared. So at some point, you know, I have the, the hope that the world will demand some shift in, in, uh, in focus and, you know, citizens and consumers will be, and, and also business people that have the tools and the skills, because we now have, you know, a whole legion of business people who have the tools, the skills and the motivation right. to put into to effectively engage. We didn't have that 25 years ago. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> well, I um, 
I appreciate your respect. We have a, we have you know about another 10, 15 minutes left or so. I thought I would um, ask you to share, if you're willing to, your uh, story of the exit. My exit firm. from my company. Yeah. And uh, and then uh, since and when that happened, and since then, what are you working on now? What are you currently working on? Well, so you know, I don't totally. You know, it's like my divorce. You know, I can't quite figure out. I can't, and I remember, you know, why it happened. I don't have like a clear idea. But I, I think, first of all, my exit and my and my business partner. So my company was started by two people. We are each 50-50 owners of the stock. So neither of neither of us neither of us had full control of 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 the decision making and operational decisions of the company. And we know, but neither of us also could change the rules. <laughs> so there are some benefits of 50-50 control, uh, but also some downsides. And we also did not have a board of directors, an independent board of directors that could that when Sean and I had some fundamental disagreement, that could say, okay, we're gonna go in this direction, measure a success, and then change course if it's not working. So we never we had to work it out ourselves. And you know, we worked it out pretty effectively for 25 years or so, but we began to have we began to have, you know, differences about what the future were. And some of it had to do with, you know, the skill set of each of us. I mean, we had, you know, we were successful in building a company up to $30 million in sales. But, you know, that's a whole different skill set than building a company to a billion dollars in sales. And, you know, maybe we weren't the guys that could do that, but we didn't have the chops or the skills or the whatever. Oftentimes that's the case that the founding, the founders basically run up against their limits in terms of ability, ability to grow, and then they have to step aside and somebody else comes in. But we didn't have a mechanism for that to happen. And also, I think fatigue, you know, he's working for something for 27 years, and, you know, this kind of soul sucking, all encompassing endeavor of running a business, uh, soul sucking in a good way, in a good sense. <laughs> you, you've been there, you know, you, you spent, you know, 20 hours a day for 15 years trying to keep things going. Um, we just ran out of we just ran out of steam. And also we are at a we sold our company in 2000, the late 2018. And there was a consolidation that was happening in our industry. The small, medium sized companies were having more difficult time competing with the large regional businesses, partly because they didn't have the capital to invest in the technology, partly because they didn't have the skill sets. And, you know, we just came to the point where we said, well, I think we've maybe reached our limits here. And so we were looking, we we were either going to have to buy something to get bigger or sell to somebody and then get out and do something else. So, you know, we sold out <laughs> basically. Um, and we, but, you know, the other thing is we, when a company that gives all of its profits away doesn't really build up much of a balance sheet. So our balance sheet was pretty much close to zero when we sold out because we yeah, didn't have any, we didn't have any assets. Uh, so we sold it for enough money so that each of us could go do something else, you know, so all the money I made from selling it has really been in, reinvested in other social enterprises because I had, you know, I have social security that I can live on and investments and stuff. But it, it was a disappointing end in some ways. But on the other hand, it was a huge relief when it happened because, you know, we had enough money to go start something else. I started another company called Community Benefit Corporation on the same model. Uh, that has been successful, but hasn't been grown because I, I'm limited because I still have a covenant not to compete. Um, but at some point, I'll think about whether or not I want to take that investment into that company and grow it into something. But I would do it differently this time because I don't want to run the thing. And I'm sure probably Sean doesn't either want to run a similar thing. For you. So, a 50 50 partner. I know that worked out well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. Well, you know, at, at least I had a partner that that had this has, still has the same values to me. So you know, right. I, I took the money that I made, which is not a whole lot of money because the company wasn't worth a whole lot. Um, and I reinvested in the stuff that I have passion about with, you know, including you, including a bunch of other companies that right. I think are doing, you know, the same things that I would be doing if I was involved in running business. So, um, so it was disappointing and uh, selfish a little bit, but you know, after 27 years, so, you know, I can kind of live with myself. <laughs> But also, our company was a very small part of something much, much larger. And so, and, and, uh, and it's, it's the larger thing that's the important thing. Because, you know, give something back was not going to move any big national or international needle in, this, in, the structure of, in the structure of capitalism or some kind of post-capitalism type of thing. It was part of something bigger. And that's, 
that something still exists and I'm still part of that. So, you know, I'm not totally, I'm not despondent or overly guilty. <laughs> I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about B Corps real quick before we wrap up. And my question uh -huh. to you was, what was it about the B Corp movement? I believe you were a founding B Corp, like impact makers. We were there together yeah. at the at Julian South, you know, California at the first B Corp event with yeah. about 15, 20 other companies. But, um, in 2007, but you know, why did you decide f to become a B Corp? Just because you give some all your profits to charity, just because you give something back, doesn't mean you have to become a B Corp. They're two separate no. things. Why become a B Corp? And it costs money. I mean, it, it's, and why it's spend money a, on becoming kind of a B Corp? What was what was the decision making? Did it help your business? Was it to be part of a movement? What was your what was yeah. your reason your firm joined as a B, became a founding B Corp? Well, first of all, there's no there's no counter argument in our business. We had no stockholders says, you know, I want to, I want a bigger return on my investment as opposed to you, you know, supporting the development of this, in, this B Corp thing. So the, uh, we could very clearly see, and yeah, we were involved in some of the early discussions before B Corp even started. You might've been in some of those meetings too, where the planning meetings about what B Corp was going to be focusing on. So we clearly saw that here were some very talented business people. I'm talking about Jay and Bart and Andrew. Um, trying to create something that would that they knew that they needed after selling their business to preserve the social mission into the future and to esc and to amplify that to the to, into the into the future so uh, and and it, it, it takes resources so and the things that B Corp has done for us that we could not do for ourselves I mean it's crazy I mean they are they are the ones that developed the benefit corporation statute and the benefit corporation statute was the legal mechanism that allowed give something back to legally protect its mission in the way that Sean and I protected out of our own commitments. But it it, it embedded those things in the in the core of the business, requiring the company, um, and also allowing us to maybe if we wanted to get additional investors, right, without right. jeopardizing the the company mission because of the superior claims of financial investors. So that work. That, that was expensive work. They had to go state by state and argue with, you know, state yeah. departments or, you know, secretaries of state to get that legislation through. And they did all that for us. We couldn't have done that for ourselves. All the measurement tools, the, the B Corp, B Corp measurement book, that is the best guide, guideline, set of guidelines, very specific guidelines that any social entrepreneur that wants to move their company more in a community friendly direction, right. that is the best tool available as a management tool for companies to use to figure out ways that they can improve their community footprint in all the different ways that B Corp measures stuff. So, so, but it's also, I mean, like I say, I grew up in a period of time where social movements were having impact in the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement. Those were not individuals. Those were movements of millions of individuals coordinated together through organizational strategies, et cetera. And our view has always been, it's the movement that's important in any way we can contribute to that movement, as long as it doesn't jeopardize our business to take care of our customers and continue to make a profit as a result of that. Right. We, we saw that as a valuable kind of investment to make. So we've always, we've been all more than willing to make those kinds of investments. And other, other, other participating, if I can understand, basically there wasn't huge amounts of value to your business specifically, but it was mission and values aligned and made all the sense in the world for you to be part of a movement rather than operating on your own as a business. Yes. Now I say that with not entire certainty because, you know, the B Corp would claim that there's a, a great benefit to having the B Corp certification on your product. Right. right. That would bring you customers. We never, ex we, I mean, obviously there are some customers that came to us as a result of our social mission, but our customers were commercial customers and their That's job right. in purchasing products, was to save money for their company, not to not to contribute to their communities. That's right. And we so, don't need, similarly, we don't experience people choosing us because of a B Corp status. Maybe subjectively, people like to work with socially responsible businesses, so it's a tiebreaker. Yeah. All else even. Well, and I think that's I think that's important. I mean, community benefit should be a banal, routine outcome of business activity, not a right. not a conscious intention to make the world a better place. Because you know right. you you can't you can't build movements on people making sacrifices against their own interests because you know that's right that's that's not a sustainable basis for building a successful organization or movement so um so the, so and and i think looking what b corp has grown into 
I mean, it's amazing how much impact that they have had. Now, there's always Milton Friedman, though, leader. that says the highest form of charity is complete, uh, you know, self interest. Exactly. <laughs> Pursuing yeah, self interest. We, <laughs> so. we, never, we never considered give something back a philanthropic entity. We were a, right. a hard nosed right. commercial competitive business whose stakeholder was the community. And right. we were operating right. in the same way as a stockholder. Any other business. Company. Is maximizing well maybe not the same way i think you treated employees better and you treated the well, environment because, and community better so it wasn't well the that's same because way. they were our stakeholders right. there was no counterpart there was no counter argument there's no investor saying don't give them a raise you know give a dividend there was no argument on behalf of stockholders in the argument about how do we how do we make our investments our distributions uh, amongst the multiple stakeholders that have conflicting interests i mean you know Fair enough. There's multiple. There's multiple stakeholders in any venture, so you you can't well, solve everyone's problems. Before we wrap up, I appreciate you taking all this time, and uh, I don't want to take more time. Otherwise, you might make me pay you ten percent more for this. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. Thank you for volunteering your time. As I'm well. getting an eight percent raise. What are you talking about? I'm getting an eight percent raise through Social Security. That's right. There you go. Um, with all of that said, um, maybe uh, you gave me a great idea, which is to ask, and you'll be the first to ask our guests, just like Ezra Klein does on his podcast, do you recommend three books? It could be about social enterprise. It doesn't have to be. Three books you recommend to everyone listening. Yeah, here, yeah, I can come up with three books, things that I learned important lessons from relative yeah. to my business experience. The first one is uh, called Ice Cream Social. It's a book about Ben and Jerry's sale to Unilever. And it's a case, it's kind of a case study. It's a, it's very, it's an easy read. It's very exciting, but it also, it goes into detail about what was gained and what was lost from the commute, from their social values in that transaction. It's a fascinating book. It's called Ice Cream Social. It's about the story of Ben and Jerry's. It's a lot of lessons for business people in there. The second one is Raising the Bar by Gary Erickson, who's the founder of, uh, of Cliff Bar. And he, he recently sold out too. What's interesting in that is is the struggles that he overcame in order to gain control of his company to protect what he considered to be the mission of the company and in the context of you know the hard nose and necessities of maintaining product quality and customer relations and all that kind of stuff in a very very competitive industry. That's that's an interesting book to read as well. Also a fun read. And the third thing I I think the most important book written in the past twenty years for me is Thomas Piketty's Capital which is okay. the, the landmark book. It's an economics book by you know a, a serious economics person, but it, it describes in the best detail how far we've come in terms of income inequality and wealth inequality, not just in terms of the numbers and from looking at like 300 years of data and the impact of that book, but also in the second half of that book is a discussion of the policies, the laws, the policies, and the regulatory changes that happened between 1978 and today that resulted in this acceleration of income disparity that we've experienced since uh, 1978 that has completely changed the way resources are shared in our economy. So it's not just the analysis of where we are today, but also the actual policies the political processes and the regulatory changes that were made in order for that change to occur. Because I think that's where the focus needs to be for many people is to get that tax structure and the regulatory structure back so that as business functions, it routinely produces less for the stockholders and more for the broader community. So those are the three books I'd recommend that everyone read that I found extremely interesting and Able well, to I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so, so much for coming and talking today. And uh, um, I didn't see any questions, but um, I am sure I know you're generous with your time. So if anybody has any additional questions for Mike, feel free to email me or- uh, Or email I, me. Or email, I don't know if you want to put your, I don't know if we can put your uh, uh, email in there for the chat for everyone, but um, maybe impact makers can, can, can yeah, if you get inquiries, you want to send out email in there if you're open to it. But uh, definitely, um, thank you for your time. It's always a wonderful, wonderful to chat with you and get your perspective. You've been doing this for a long time. I've been on a lot of, uh, on a on a couple of uh, 
panel discussions with you and I always enjoy the conversation. So I really appreciate you taking some time to talk to us today. And uh, also, and keep up the great work yourselves. I mean, you know, we, we're, like, we're all part of the same movement. So, uh, you know, I appreciate the work that you guys are doing, all the other social entrepreneurs out there trying to, trying to make a fair world that works for all, all of us, not just a few of us. Well, thank you. Thanks for all you do. And uh, good talking with us always. And hope to see you at the, uh, ASBN event coming up in December. I'll see you there. Take it All easy. Right. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye.